Welcome to the uh, Agilicus webinar of the week. We are here with my CTO, Nick. Nick, nice to meet everyone. Uh, I, uh, you know, as John says, I'm the uh, CTO here at Agilicus, working on making our technology serve the OT and manufacturing space. The hard problems. Yeah. Uh, today we're going to be talking about specifically manufacturing and looking at the objectives. How do we keep these manufacturing lines operational? How do we keep them safe? How do we keep everything efficient? We come from the angle of security, specifically cybersecurity, and we're going to talk about uh, a few examples anecdotally that we have run into over the last you know, year or so, really diving into this. I think between the two of us, we've probably worked with about 100 organizations in this space, largely on easy. a similar problem set. So yeah, easy. Yep. So let's dive in. To frame up the discussion today, we're going to be talking about, you know, highlighting what's changed in manufacturing over the last little while. Like we mentioned, cloud, IoT, mm -hmm. AI, access, right? what all these acronyms yeah. mean. Uh, you know, there's a, a few double-edged swords, right? The more doors you put on a house, the more locks you need. Mm -hmm. So we're going to dive into that, explore that a little bit with everybody, the pros, the cons, what to be aware of, what to look for. Uh, what we call the balance game, security. Yeah. Oh yeah, efficiency. Uh, one that hasn't been considered for a long, long time, right? And now uh, we're sort of faced with that balance, so uh, that, that we sort of have to uh, get into the mindset of security by design. And that's important in this area, right? Because we're dealing with systems that are 20, 30 years old that yeah. weren't designed to be on the internet in the first place. Yeah, yeah, we'll talk about that. It'll be interesting. Yeah, and the key is. Tie it back to the organization strategy, right? This has to be fast. It has to be safe. You can't impact the organization's ability to output. Uh, and that's really where we get tied up or have historically get tied up. And we can bring in all these new initiatives, all these new protocols, but it impacts the bottom line. So how do we do that and actually save money at the end of the day? Uh, and with that, the heavy cost of downtime. Mm. Yeah, I mean, we've prioritized operationalization, constantly being up. Uh, downtime is a no-no, obviously, in our OT space. Uh, and sometimes we'll see, you know, that we go back to the balance game. Safety has been the one thing we took away. So uh, we'll, uh, we'll look at that. And it doesn't matter. That one's a unique one because it doesn't matter the industry. It could be manufacturing. Sure. It could be, you know, our, the power distribution systems we work with, the wastewater facilities that we work with. One, those systems can't go down because as soon as they go down, it starts to become a financial issue. And two, they have real impact. Sometimes it's public safety. <laughs> sometimes it's just brand trust erosion. Oh, absolutely. So, uh, you know, bringing in the access and the evolution here that we're going to cover, we don't want that to jeopardize you know, that uh, the heavy cost of downtime. So. Yeah. And then, so finally, what we're going to do, we're going to explore a few key, key themes throughout this. Uh, you know, obviously, because of our background, it's going to focus on security, specifically cybersecurity. It's going to be really rooted in this aspect of least privilege, right? Least privilege access. What does that mean? What does that mean to these type of organizations? What does that mean to the vendors that support these type of organizations? The Siemens, the Rockwells, those who need to connect to PLCs that are on factory floors that in a perfect world shouldn't be connected to the Internet in the first place. And so the first theme of the day is, you know, why are we here? Nick, maybe I'll throw kind of an open question over to you. What have you seen change in manufacturing over the last two years, five years, so on, where we need to talk about this in the first place? Yeah, you casually just have them listed there. So it's gonna feel be, free to read. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> you know, from a density of sensors and, and, uh, uh, and tooling in the industrial control zones, we've now changed the philosophy where we're applying more access. So some of the IoT systems, for example, base systems, for example, require access to go to the cloud, push some data, get some analytics, get the changes back. Sometimes it's just basically the software, the control software needs its own licensing through the cloud. Uh, so sometimes our policies of having a full air gap, uh, no access from our control system uh, software components no longer works. So we need to start embracing some of the access capabilities that are driven by the adoption of these sensors. You list AI, you list cloud, a lot of it is access in and out of our, of our industrial control system zones uh, in general. So that could be from the software specific aspect of the controlling 
uh, components, but the hardware itself, the sensor zone, sometimes need to go out now if it's only for firmware access, CRA re certificate revocation list, for example, in the operating systems, uh, or just accessing data sets yeah. that it needs to get updated. We used to have our historian on, on sites for those that use SCADA. Sometimes now, no, they're, they're not. So uh, the, the processes that are being driven require access, and we need to respond to that because we sort of made a conscious decision a long time ago uh, you know, to, to keep our system, if not updated, completely isolated yeah. for the sake of security so that we could control the operational status of our uh, equipment uh, to a very high uh, uptime uh, levels. And now that's starting to change, right? So that brings a new landscape of, of threats and security considerations. So I think that's important to, to pause on for a second. And effectively, what I think you're saying, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that over the last few years, if not last decade, we've seen a lot of technology be introduced into an environment that previously did not have that type of exposure to technology. The reason why we saw that technology brought in is to limit errors. We're seeing all this automation come in because you and I make mistakes. And if we can take those mistakes out, guess what? Revenue goes up, yeah. right? But with that automation, like Nick said, everything needs access, whether it's an IoT sensor that needs access outbound to a cloud environment, whether it's a management team that needs access to a dashboard to make sure that line's operating smoothly, or if it's a vendor that needs access just to make sure that, you know, that PLC is supported and maintained and it doesn't go down and bring the entire line down. No, exactly. So we have much more efficient workflows, Yeah. but the demand for those efficient workflows is access to AI, to cloud analytics, for example. So there's a component there that we've, you know, 30 years ago, we had a very well-defined Purdue model. Our zones were very well segmented. We had a DMZ, we were sort of doing your network diodes. Uh, now it's sort of getting blurred a little bit with the IT demarcation, right? Uh, so remote access and secure remote access is adding a lot of complexity. So we have to, uh, you know, we have to address that. And that's what I want to come back to in a few slides because Nick mentioned the Purdue, Purdue model in terms of how everything's divvied out. And you know we've done some work with ISA and some other groups mm -hmm. and that's being updated as, almost right. as we speak. Yeah, the reality of cloud is now coming into the ISA standard. So yeah. Okay, we're going, to, we're going to circle back to that. Uh, the next step is so we talked about all this change that's happening. We understand why we're moving in a direction. It's all about automation and making sure that everything's more efficient. You've alluded to the fact that this opens up the need for access. This opens up the risk exposure. What does that threat landscape look like? What should somebody who is in charge of making sure the operations run smoothly, what are they, what should be in the back of their mind? Well, the first one is understanding where we've come from, from either an industrial control system or even now the distributed control systems. What are the security policies that historically have been implemented, security devices? Mm -hmm. And are they a match for today's implementation of the systems? And in large part, they're not. Uh, we've gone from a full perimeter defense with our DMZ and our firewalls, but now we need relationships of data transmissions and workflows between very well-known and under well-understood resources. Uh, chasing those with firewall rules becomes tedious. Yeah. Uh, and more than that, once we're breached at the perimeter with a traditional firewall setup. Yeah. Uh, the consequences are pretty dire once people are inside our OT system and we've seen ran you know, time and time again, ransomware and crypto lockers. And typically they come in through one system and then they go laterally within the organization. And that's something that you know we, we need to address and be very proactive in, in implementing things like zero trust that we'll look at. Okay, and that's interesting. So you mentioned a few things there that I think are key to highlight. So we're going to talk about breaches mm -hmm. generally. How do things get in? Why do things get in? Why are we going to talk about ways and show you ways to stop that from happening or at least significantly reduce the risk of that happening? You've talked about ransomware, mm -hmm. you know, different crypto lockers. There's all kinds of aspects that, that you should be aware of. And so I think in a couple slides, we're going to go through some strategies to identify the vectors that those things happen, and then how do you put uh, you know, processes, things in place to eliminate that, but to keep you on that trajectory of automation and efficiency? Perfect. Okay, right on. From a consequence perspective, 
this is the one nobody likes to think about. It's like getting, you know, a bill in the mail. Mm -hmm. You don't want to look at your bank account and say, okay, how much money do I have? Do I got to pay this today? Yeah. Right? Nobody likes to think about this, but it's a reality. Yeah. And the metrics are quite different in OT, right? An IT shop can have its data input workstations down for a couple hours. There's backups. Do a backup, come back. You know, you may want to pay out a ransom or not. In the OT space, the cost is in time and operational. So having your public order system down for any amount of time, and there were, you know, and, and now that that you know there's a reporting standard, yeah, uh, an onus on the uh, the systems uh, to 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 declare these outages. So there's a reputational one, yeah, but there's the operational one, which I think my personal opinion overall is greater than the economical yeah. uh, uh, damage that can occur. Absolutely, and manufacturing. We work with a manufacturer. They ran into an incident unrelated to cybersecurity. They had to take one line down of their of their, mm -hmm. their plastics line. Yep. And what happened was because of that, they have to shut everything down, clean it. And the restart is just expensive, right? It's ridiculous. Yeah. So you multiply that out by, you know, time and time again throughout the year, you start to see some some pretty serious impacts. Yep. So when we're talking about security and manufacturing, we've talked about a few different concepts. The one we're going to talk about today specifically is least privileged access what that means exactly, how that impacts the bottom line, and how that can keep your operation basically moving forward. So, I mean, you're, it's probably better coming from you than me if you want to dive sure. into the, the definition. I, I think the, the how I like to approach the, uh, the concept is really to talk about what it's not, because mm -hmm. typically a lot of people are hesitant to go to uh, this model because they think you're going to take my tools and my uh, software away and I'm going to be reduced to what I can use and it's totally not about that. Uh, it's about really understanding the level of access required by any tool yeah. uh, in any system uh, in order to successfully complete their tasks. So why give more permissions? Sometimes it's out of you know an abundance of necessity. We don't have time to really craft these policies. We don't have the tools to learn what the uh, usage resources. Uh, but if we can, then we really maximize the operational efficiency because every single tool is tailored to access the resources that it needs. So it does not affect productivity. In fact, it enhances productivity because if there is some exposure yeah. as any tool being compromised, whether internally or, or through the software uh, manufacturer itself, then the exposure is well understood right away. You know exactly uh, by the very de security definition of what these tools can access and you know, what's your, what your exposure, where it is accessed in your network. So uh, it's, it's extremely useful to implement. And now, you know, nowadays we have the right tools to profile what these resources are. So keeping them to a minimum makes a lot of sense. So if I had to summarize that, it means not everyone needs access to everything. Correct. Both employees as well as external vendors. Correct. But at times, those people absolutely need access to something. Oh, yeah. And it's not a binary function that you don't get access ever to any system. Yeah. Uh, there are definitely in the course of employment of a full-time employee or a vendor or a third party or contractor need to deviate from what's called, you know, from the day-to-day -day chores and using a very different specialty tool, let's say, for a shutdown or a change in a manufacturing plant. Yeah. Uh, and, and those need to be accommodated. So it's not about losing your cool tools or losing your toolbox. It's about ensuring that the tools that you use have the right access and no more than that. Uh, and that can be defined by your employment role, by uh, you know, your relationship with the company, whether yeah. you're an in-house employee or you're coming from outside. Could be by the types of tools you have, the types of devices you have, whether okay. you're doing it from a Starbucks or from the plant you know, manufacturing line itself. So there's a lot of considerations to be taking uh, into account here. Okay, so the you know simple answer for the simple-minded folks like myself, if you come over to my house and ask me to use my bathroom, I don't want you walking through and checking my fridge and everything else, I want you to use one thing, correct, and then get out. Correct. I say something about blast radius, but that would be a... yeah. There you go. Careful. Uh, so from a from a practical standpoint, I know you and I both worked on a project with an auto manufacturing company. They had I couldn't tell you how many robotic arms on mm -hmm. the on the one facility's floor, and their goal was when vendor X needs to connect to support you know arm th robot arm three, mm -hmm. everything to that remote vendor, sometimes in a different country looks the exact same, right? They're just connecting to one different digit. So they need to ensure they're not connecting to four through 10. They're connecting to robot arm three, robot yeah. arm three, 
only because if they connect it to the wrong one, they're not on the factory floor. They don't see what happens. If they swing that around, they could kill somebody. Yeah, so the principle of the, you know, basically your, your physical interlock. Right? Yeah. You disable a line, you interlock it with everyone that works on it has their own keypad, right? And uh, sort of key lock and then and, and lock the line. The same thing can be applied here at a digital level from yeah. the network access, understanding that you have access to a very specific piece of machinery for maintenance, for example, yeah. uh, you shouldn't have access to the other ones. So that's almost moving from micro segmentation to absolute isolation. Yeah. Okay, interesting. The key here is that what we have to tie it back to, both as business leaders within manufacturing, as well as you know the people who support those individuals on this side of the table, the core benefits of that, absolutely, it's security, mm -hmm. but it ties back to the manufacturing bottom line, right? It protects not only sensitive data that might be contained within that machine, it yep. protects the people around them, and it protects the operational efficiency of that line. And traditionally, if you've had a VPN, yeah. you've had to be extremely diligent about the rules of that VPN from a security perspective, who can access what and how. Uh, and it's a tedious process from yeah. an IT perspective to manage VPNs, manage access to resources, having created firewall exception rules uh, everywhere and keeping up with them. So that becomes you know, administrating least privilege via a firewall except a set of firewall exception rules uh, you know has got to go away and uh, you know there, there are much better ways of doing it and that's why likely depending on which side of the table you sit on for for the individuals watching in the audience but if you are one of those OEMs that support a piece of equipment that's on somebody else's factory floor when you get the answer of no we're not giving you a VPN mm. that's exactly why is because they can't guarantee in my simple example that you go right to the bathroom right it's you're checking out everything because you have the option to yeah it, 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 it's a pain to audit yeah uh it, it's a pain to keep up with from a life cycle it's a pain to keep up your accounting of yeah. who's getting in who has access you know do you have separate accounts separate active directory seats for the logins and so on uh, all all of it can be done in a much better environment and so what we're talking about here is really saying, okay, we live in a world that relies on, on VPNs. I might be in a different country and support your facility. Mm -hmm. I might have facilities in different countries. And VPNs, arguably speaking, it's like running a long Ethernet cord. You start to connect two different things as if they're one. So you spend all this money to isolate your control network, your industrial network from your corporate network. But as soon as a VPN is spun up to a vendor or to another corporate network so management can check on the dashboards, it blows up what you thought you've, you've air-gapped to date. Yeah, and if we want to get a little bit in the technicalities of it, right? Uh, once you've established your VPN client, you have a routed network into the, you know, the manufacturing zone. Uh, historically, uh, you know, routing all of your remote traffic through the VPN has been cumbersome. Right? No, if I'm at home and I'm VPNing to a customer, I don't want all of my internet traffic in the background to go through it, all my email checking, because they'll be blocked and then my yeah. experience suffers and I can't really do my work. So historically we've Im implemented things like split tunneling, where we say only the local network of the manufacturer needs to go through uh, that VPN. And that's made things better I, because I could still check my emails, for example, over my public network access and then route my manufacturing software workflows over the VPN. The problem with that now is that, you know, there, there's multiple papers that have come out since and say split tunneling is a huge attack vector. The reason for that is, you know, I connect to the manufacturing zone. I have a route for the equipment. There's nothing stopping the person operating the router, for example, in the, in the Starbucks or cafe to give me more precise routes, yeah. right? So I slash 32s for every host. And all of a sudden now my traffic meant from my manufacturing partners going through someone else uh, who's passed routes and many devices like Macs and, and, and Android devices are susceptible to that. Uh, and you wouldn't know the difference. So uh, VPNs have served their purposes of delivering resources to users, but they're, you know, they, they have um, basically enshrined themselves in legacy systems and moving away from that uh, enhances security. Spike quite a bit. So I don't know if you know the answer to this, but it popped into my mind as you were talking about that. How long have VPNs been around? Well, I think as long as networks have been around. Uh, I think the creation of 
VPNs when we talk about linking networks and encrypting the tunnel between them dates back to you know, the 80s and you know, the really? early days of IPsec. And, and then, so there's ways to make it we make it better, and um, they have made them better over sure. time. But it's time for a new process. Yeah, we've gone from like, like layer two L2TP to IPsec to you know our, our IKE uh, uh, sort of security associations. We moved to TLS-based VPN to try to be a little higher level, less cumbersome. Overall, you know, the N in VPN is where the problem lies. It's it's a routed network between two. Uh, entities. Uh, so whatever is on your network that could be on your machine that could try to go and traverse east-west on my manufacturing zone is still going to occur. So for some individuals who may not have had the benefit to see some of our other, you know, more technical webinars, when we're talking about the difference between VPNs and how they operate today and mm -hmm. their use today, and we introduce concepts like directly connecting to applications, directly connecting to PLCs without connecting to the network. Yeah. Explain the difference. Well, the difference is we've used VPN. We understand the concept of credentials to network access. You log in, you have a credential, the username and a password, it gets verified. You terminate a tunnel remotely, you link the networks together. Okay. Now, are you ultimately wishing to do this or is it a means to an end? Um, you want to use you know, your manufacturing tool, let's say a program a PLC with RS links. Okay. You just want RS links to reach the PLC at a certain address. You, you don't need access to the network. You want access to the resource in, in your Purdue zone. When we introduce a concept like zero trust or resource only access, we move away from credentials. We're talking about identity, who you are, yeah. what you have, your two factor, or the tool itself, RS Link Studio 5000, for example, uh, and the PLC at the far end. That Those are, we're obfuscating the network, we're not going to give people access to the networks. We're going to present a resource once you can confirm your identity and you'll be able to in interoperate with it at the least level of permission required to accomplish whatever workflow you're, you're working on. So that's a big difference. We're not going to grant you network access. We're not going to let you scan other devices because they're just simply not routed uh, to you. Uh, so that's a big difference here when we talk about access to manufacturing components. And so if you are a facility, and you do have a vendor supporting you remotely or even mm -hmm. staff that need remote access, the key there is you are not letting them connect to your network. Correct. What you're allowing under this least privileged framework is you're allowing them to have the least amount of access possible to do their job. To a specific resource. To yeah. a very specific resource. Yeah. And what we've seen time and time again, once that's implemented, is you know what the case study to the, to the right of your screen is alluding to, right? What happens is response times go up. You don't have to waste time doing unnecessary access requests mm -hmm. that have to be, you know, allowed by certain departments. There's access when they, when access is needed. Yeah, almost uh, instantly. We have manufacturers overseas, European based, that can launch their industrial control system tooling locally, you know, on their corporate land and have immediate access. Once they can provide the identity, their identity and vouch for that, uh, access to uh, industrial control systems overseas in, in the United States and the Midwest. So they don't need to VPN. They don't need to dish out individual accounts for VPN. They don't need to be in secure location. They don't need to fly over and be connected to the LAN. We deliver that seamless integration you know, components to, to uh, control tools. And I don't think I have to make this stretch in how response times have to do with operational efficiency, right? It's... You limit the downtime, you keep things moving. Enhanced security is, is what we do. We're, we guarantee that that site is, is cloaked from anybody online. They can't see right. it. Right? Yeah, again, we're talking, we're, it's not a routed network. We're not exposing resources. You don't have exceptions for in your firewall. In fact, you can scan your firewall. There's nothing listening. Yeah. You're going to get a, a, an extremely good, what we call security posture, which is you have the best practices employed at your firewall level, at any level of your segmentation. Nothing is listening. Nothing is exposed. Uh, the connectivity is done through a cloud platform, but anyone that wishes to access needs to initiate connections themselves. Yeah. So there's, it's, it's a very good model. And these are IT concepts. These are cybersecurity terms. These are you know theories and strategies that are implemented on the IT and OT side of the house. But at the end of the day, it's about helping the business, right? The business doesn't go down. It doesn't experience breaches. Yeah. It's It keeps it moving. Correct. Yeah. And so... When we're talking about IT and OT, to date, 
They've been talked about separately. I don't even think they like being in the same room. <laughs> they together. don't have beer together. They don't. They do not. <laughs> There's no Super Bowl parties. And what happens is they they have two different objectives. Yep. Right. The objective of the OT folks and the industrial control system folks, they need to keep things moving. Right. They get blamed if something goes down. They need to get output. They need to make sure they have access when they need access. Yep. The IT folks. That's different. They need to protect the network. They're responsible to make sure that nothing bad gets in the network and everything's streamlined from a networking perspective. Yeah. And, and in the advance that we talked about at the intro here, you know, a lot of the new tooling in the OT space or even distributed control system space uh, now require some approach that has been a little bit more IT centric. Mm -hmm. uh, so we look at you know, principles like zero trust network access that we can now employ within the OT space to give resource specific access uh, with zero trust uh, for people requiring access to the industrial control system zones. Things I mentioned using your credentials, right? Like identity management, not something that has been thought of uh, frequently in OT where everybody either shares the same password or the password is on a sticky note on the screen, but there's a full DMZ, your air gap, no one's gonna, gonna ever come in until someone plugs in a compromised USB device with malware, right? So there's always a lot of vectors that are uh, uh, still present in, in the OT network and applying some of the functionality and principles in the IT security tooling to OT makes sense, yeah. uh, but it needs to be done well. Like I mentioned, you don't want to take people's tools away or the ability to be efficient at uh, accomplishing their workflow. So if we look at a couple of these generalized, I don't want to go through every single one, but if we generally cherry pick a few of these, what I'm seeing on the right side of this is a theme around very granular access, uh, device or resource level access, encryption, outbound only. Why are those concepts important from an ICS or OT perspective? Yeah, so about 15 years ago, when, uh, well, 20 years ago when the cloud started coming out, the concept of a perimeter, a defended perimeter with your firewall sort of blew up uh, and we accepted what's called a shared, a shared responsibility model where certain uh, departments like IT or OT are responsible for security or access or operational management and you know they, have, they all have to work together. What we find now is that when we apply things like accessing devices on an OT uh, zone, principles of network diodes still apply. Yeah. We still want them, but we just want them to be modernized. We still want an air gap. We don't need our devices like our PLC to have network access. They don't need to have a gateway and go out on the internet. But what they can have is access to remote systems. Remote vendors or contractors or maintenance workers can come in securely yeah. using encryption uh, with a good reputation where we can audit who's doing what and when, even if we still employ for the time being out of necessity shared credentials, for example. So don't do away with your systems, make them secure and you know, see what the uh, uh, you know, lack of perimeter uh, means when we talk about security tooling. And it ends up being a much better system in our industrial control systems. So on the OT side of the house, a network in general that was built without security in mind Mm -hmm. has now been introduced via the concepts we talked about earlier, yep. IoT, cloud, you know, AI even to get different set points in. That network, which had no concept of security, is now being exposed to a world on the IT side of the house that has been very aware of security for a long time. Yeah, so the concept of security apply was air gap. My system will never go out on the internet. Therefore, I have to accept some liability that my systems may not ever update themselves, for mm -hmm. example. So the second they're out on the internet, either they're an operating system that's end of life, no longer supported, there's no longer any patches, or even my SSL certificates are expired. Uh, my, uh, my, my root CAs, for example, are not updated. So that was an accepted level of risk. Now that that perimeter is sort of disappearing, we need to concentrate around these specific resources. So let me stop you there because Probably one of the most con common things that, that I certainly run into, and I think you might as well, is that everyone thinks that they have the best air gap. Mm -hmm. It's like everybody thinks their child is the most beautiful child. Yes. Everybody thinks their air gap Correct. is the most beautiful air gap. Why aren't they cutting it right now? Well, the reason I explain is as soon as you start introducing new control systems, yeah. new sensors and new devices, 
you start making exceptions for them because they have new requirements. So now you're saying, okay, well, I'm going to be truly air-gapped except for this sensor. I'm going to be truly air-gapped except for this software license server that's going to have two NICs because it needs to check its license on the internet, and it's going to have another segment on my industrial control systems. So we start making exceptions, and that's where the lapse occur. It could be historically someone having a compromised laptop that they bring on the you know, onto the network, you know, people used to pride themselves on having my IT laptop and my OT laptop, and yeah. then all of a sudden they start merging, and then sometimes a guy, you know, just for this time, I'll plug my IT laptop on the OT network. So it, it's a story about making exceptions to my perfect air gap. I have a child, but he has a couple blemishes, right? Yeah. And ultimately, you lose control from a life cycle management of what these exceptions are and where they are, and understanding then the impact of one of these devices being compromised now is huge uh, because you've made these exceptions. You have your devices that may not be updated from a security perspective. And that's where your air gap fails. Okay. So out of necessity, you've made exceptions. Over time, your air gap becomes imperfect yeah. and unmanageable. With the new tools uh, that require some level of access, you are no longer you, you're no longer capable of, have, of having a 100% true air gap with new tooling. You, know, I, you say, you know, perfect child. How many locations have I been in where I've been stated that this is a fully air gap network and there's a 4G LTE modem on the wall? Nearly all. And you're like, <laughs> where is that going, right? So the reality is you can approach this with a zero trust uh, uh, approach. Uh, of having each resource individually managed from the level of outbound communication that it has, who can have access to it in a secure manner, um, and you know, understanding the impact of any compromise on the network. So I want to dive into that, and I think the next slide may talk about that specifically. And before we do that, I want to frame up one thing, because it's something that I think you said and I run into very, very often. So when I open the conversation about air gaps. Yeah, my network's totally air gapped, it's perfect, yeah. nothing crosses, okay, great. What happens when you have an issue with one of, the, one of the lines? What happens when a PLC goes down? And that seems to be the gotcha because it's a very, very difficult use case, right? I have a vendor, Schneider Electric, Rockwell, Siemens, that need to get mm -hmm. you know, remote access just in time to make sure that they clear that air, that line doesn't go down. Yep. And what's being done with a perfectly air gap network, they spin up a VPN, they give team viewer access, they open some kind of door that blows that air gap open, right? And, and it, so, become, it becomes a surface for, for exploitation, yeah. So with that, when I go and pull up this slide, this slide, you know, represents, obviously you're familiar. Represent, yeah, <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> represents what we're doing in this space, which yeah. is, from an outcome perspective, the outcome is, is exactly the same. From a usability perspective, it's drastically easier because we take all the security that we've talked about and we make it invisible. Correct. But tell me the difference between what we're doing here and that specific PLC remote support example. Right. So this slide combines a number of approaches and, and systems. So we talk about identity management. I want to give that vendor emergency access to that PLC you just mentioned. Do I go in my VPN concentrator, create a username for them with a password and give it to them, say don't share it, get shared anyways. Yeah. So the, on the left hand side, we see identities. So if I'm going to give you, contractor or manufacturer, access uh, to a critical device on my uh, industrial control zone, I want to make sure that it is you and I want to be able to audit this and make sure that even if I have a weak username and password uh, to access my HMI or my PLC that it is you accessing it. So I'll use identity management. Okay. I'll let you identify yourself and use your personal or corporate credentials to access this resource. And that way, if you're connected to an Office 365 or Microsoft shop with Azure AD, for example, then I have the verification that you've done this. Okay. If your employer requires you to use multi-factor, then I have that added benefit. If the, your employer does not require you to do multi-factor, but I wish that you did, I could implement that as well. Or you, if you didn't know. Correct. So I could say, you can come in, but you need to use a, a multi-factor, and I'm going to prompt you for a one-time password, or use your, your, uh, your, your, the crypto kit on your phone or your laptop to come in. 
That's the first thing. In the middle, what I'm doing then is I'm not going to expose that resource from a VPN perspective. I'm going to front end that resource and protect it. Okay. All right. Think reverse proxy, but you know that's sort of shelling, selling it short. I'm going to allow you to access this device via public cloud infrastructure that is very well known, very well understood, and very well protected. You're going to have to show your credentials, and once those credentials are, 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 are verified successfully, I am going to tunnel your application traffic. Let's say you have a PLC programmer or RS who, for example. Uh, I'm going to let you use that tool specifically on your workstation and only that tool to come in through the cloud interface. And I'm going to deliver that traffic only to that PLC at the top there that's highlighted, in this case, an HMI or uh, a dashboard that we see, regardless of where you're coming from. And I'm going to do that through a, a little piece of software that I'm going to run on your secure network called the connector by Agilicus. What that connector does, does not listen. Mm -hmm. You can't connect to it. It only ever connects through your firewall out to our secure cloud using TLS. So now I have two secure mechanisms. I have connected you securely to our cloud, and I've connected a connector device, the Agilicus connector, to the cloud both securely. Two outbound connections. Two outbound connections. That firewall does not have any exceptions for inbound connectivity. There is no inbound connection attempts. You can do a deny star dot star on that firewall. Extremely clean security posture. Your hygiene is, is top notch at that point. Once that's established and I have a session token confirming your identity, the resource you need access to, the level of permission you want on that resource, yep. I'm going to establish a transport uh, virtually over that entire connectivity end to end. That's going to allow you, the person, regardless of where you are, I'm going to allow it, uh, to access that very specific device, that HMI at that very little port. I could build a web application firewall on top of this. Now I'm going to secure this end-to-end. -end. Once that's established, let's say you're, you have some nefarious or compromised software on your laptop. It does not have layer 3 access. It cannot route to that device because it, it's not in your routing stack. Yeah. It does not have the ability to go east-west within that secure network because, again, we're not routed. We only have a tunneled access uh, for a specific application to this HMI. I can view this HMI on my web browser. I am not using any specific tooling. I'm not telling you, for example, I need an emergency access, but first, go download this VPN client. Yeah. I'm not going to do that. You're going to use your regular tooling. You're going to use your regular software, whether it's web-based for an HMI, whether it's your industrial control software, uh, whether it's a SQL backend, uh, you know, whether it's a remote desktop, I'm going to get you access to these devices. And these devices continue to be air-gapped. They themselves have no access to the internet. They cannot route out. You cannot go side scripting on them. They cannot pull data from third parties. They are only accessible via that local connector uh, software. So that's a huge difference with VPN. So you don't care who the users are. Could be your own users, could be external users. Mm -hmm. You don't care what device they're on. Correct. Because you're, and you don't care about the posture of that device. And I'm not issuing you credentials. And you're not issuing credentials. Yeah. Simplified from the user side. Yeah. From the right side of this diagram, you only want to give them access to one very specific thing on the network. So what you're doing under this least privileged framework under zero trust is you're, nothing else exists to them. Everything is a threat. I am only ever going to give you access to that very singular resource, and a resource means a service. Yeah. Uh, it's not a part of a network. It's not a segment. It's not even an IP address. It's a very specific resource on that workstation or on that PLC, the very specific TCP and port, but I'm going to also ensure you're reusing the right tool to come in. From an air gap perspective, you're making a single outbound connection out of that site, right, to the internet? Correct. From a user perspective, you're making an outbound connection also to meet that at our broker. Correct. You're not making a single inbound connection. Correct. There is no piercing inbound of that firewall. Correct. Uh, and, the device, the and the resource itself doesn't have internet access either. It's walled off from the internet. Correct. And so that air gap now stays intact. And that's where we have zero trust. Okay. And so... Speaking specifically to, I don't know if we have any Rockwell folks on the call, but let's let's poke a little fun at them. Studio 5000, it's a beast of a thick mm -hmm. client. It's quite the suite, right? I'm a, I'm a user supporting a remote ma manufacturing facility. I'm 
running that on my laptop. There's a couple different deployments, I understand, but yeah. I'm running that on my laptop. Usually, I either have to be on that network or spin up a network connection, a VPN, yeah. to then allow that software to connect to a PLC on the far side. Explain it in this regard. Well, in this regard, uh, I call you in emergency. I say, I, I need you to you open up RS links and check the firmware or the communication status of my PLC, for example. Mm -hmm. I'm going to tell you, go to you know, my a profile, a website I just told you about, and launch your RS links locally on your workstation um, from that profile. So I'm going to get you a login. You're going to say, I want to start RS links on my workstation. Yep. You have not installed anything. Your regular software installation still starts. But this time, when you're going to go to a very specific IP address or a host, even with a specific stop Rockwell Ethernet driver or yep. Ethernet IP driver, for example, that very specific PLC that I've selected will all of a sudden go through that platform, will terminate transparently, RS links or the tool, uh, its network connectivity will transparently be terminated through that pre-established tunnel to our back end of our cloud. So it will think it is at the point of view of our connector? Correct. Once that relationship is established, you've identified yourself. Yeah. So from a user behavior, the only difference is as soon as you say, I want to open that PLC, yeah. your browser is going to pop up with your corporate login existing. You say, John at contractor, look at your two factor. If yeah. you have one, you're going to put it in. And then once your identity is verified and you see the return from that phase on your browser saying, okay, now I know who you are, yeah. immediately you'll see your tooling connect. Everything just works. Exactly. You haven't started a VPN client. You don't know what the remote IP is. All you see now is that that PLC based on the IP or the host name that you're used to using is now terminating as if you were plugged straight into it. And from the IT manager's perspective who just granted me access, yeah. All you do is put my email address in and select the level of permission I have. Correct. I don't know what your corporate username, password is. I just know yeah. your email address. I say John at has access to this PLC. Once John has gone and authenticated, let's say Office 365, I now have a full audit from Microsoft yeah. as a, uh, a shared identity provider that you have accessed this, you've used your factor, your two-factor, and you're at this IP address, you're using this tool, and you're now coming into my network. And Angelicus handles the rest. You don't have to spin up accounts, spin down Correct. accounts, it just works. Correct. And, and, and you could even request that resource yourself dynamically. So let's say you come back six hours later, so I need to do something else. You could go back into that platform, say, hey, Nick, I need access again to that PLC tomorrow from 4 a.m. to 6 a.m., could you grant this? My phone will buzz. I'll roll out of bed. So John is, you know, still needs to do some stuff. I'll say, yes, John can do it again tomorrow morning. So we're not just talking about operational efficiency from the manufacturing line perspective. We're talking about productivity from the teams. Correct. Right? You're not Absolutely. wasting time going back and forth, waiting for an answer. Okay, spin up this account. Oh, you created the wrong thing. They got, he got the password wrong. Breach, you know, change the password. Yeah, the impact is huge. Yeah. It's, the platform handles it all. Yeah. And so that's where we've seen some, some excellent results, to be honest. You know, quick diagnosis, we all know we want that, right? Immediately address the concern, get remote access into the hands of people who need it, fix the problem, right? Minimize the downtime, minimize the actual production loss. No truck roll. Yeah. No truck roll. Yeah. You don't have to come to site. You don't have to figure out or hack a way to, together to do it. You know, from both a team's, internal teams and a vendor's perspective, you centralize how everything's done, right? You know, you unify all these systems into one thing where exactly what you just said. All you got to do is worry about an email address and what level of access they yeah. have. And you don't have don't to have. wake up IT to make exceptions and provision VPN accounts. and That vendor whatever. can request access. Exactly. Right? You know, so it, it enhances that kind of collaboration aspect, right? Okay, I can give you access. Okay, you know, Log on, view my screen, I clicked here, here, and here, and then it blew up. Why did, why did that happen? How do we fix that, right? And that it's not just the user to machine. We're talking in an IoT world, mm -hmm. thing to cloud. M2M, -M, machine to machine, or even EVX, uh, you know, vehicles to anything, sensor to sensor, sensor to cloud, cloud to analytics, back to uh, you know, management software. Um, you know, we, we talked about the scenario where you access yeah. it, but the reality is, very, very often with the cloud integration, it's machine to machine with crypto credentials uh, that are issued for, for these devices. And going back to that previous slide, you have IoT sensors, 
you need to get that data at least into a dashboard, if not into a data lake or some kind of cloud environment. Our method of getting that outbound also does, you don't open up any ports. It doesn't right. pierce that air gap, but it keeps right. it intact. And only the devices that you selected can communicate. And so, you know, from a cybersecurity perspective, it's great. We can, you know, jump up and down all day and say, say why it's secure and why you need security. But at the end of the day, it comes down to the results. What kind of results are we seeing? I mean, this year alone, what did I mention earlier? Between the two of us, uh, at least 100 different use cases. Mm -hmm. And so increased um, efficiency in terms of dollars. I cherry picked one. Um, obviously, it's, it's a good one. I'm not going to cherry pick a bad one. 15% uh, is what they calculated, right? They had a calculation of what they traditionally see in terms of an efficiency loss, downtime due to this or that or a delay, and what that translates into $5 million annually, right? Error reduction. Humans make errors. I forget to kill this, you know, anything that's not automated. I forget to kill this person's account. They left the company. That vendor still has access. It's a prime uh, attack vector for you, all the time. You and I talked to a major airport. What did they say? Oh, we, we got to review our uh, VPN accounts. Our VPN accounts. We have 30. We only have five vendors. Yeah. Right? So, you know, there's that kind of error. So they also had a calculation of, you know, how much was attributed to that over the core of the averages over the previous years. They threw a dollar, val dollar value on that. And then productivity, right? So just how many hours go into unnecessary access requests over the course of a year and potentially, you know, thousands, even hundreds of thousands of access requests for the largest companies, what does that translate into dollar values? And that's the way to look at it, as well as convince your team internally that this is important. It's not just because we want to be yeah. more secure. We yeah. want results. And I think the one thing that goes on said is easy adoption. Yeah. Right. If you can't sell, if you can't, make your group accept the culture of security because you have onerous tooling, different yep. workflows. Now you have to use a VPN and stuff like that. Acceptance of the security is paramount for people to use it. Yep. Otherwise, they'll find ways to circumvent it. So if you don't have any new tooling, you don't need new clients, you don't have to provision new software, uh, you tell your employees you do it the same way as before, with the same tools as before, then acceptance then uh, becomes a thing. Yeah. And then you become more secure by design overnight. Yeah, the same, the same logic in terms of automating the factory floor goes into security. Correct. You know, a lot of things from a, a networking security aspect or point of view that you were doing manually because it's necessary, automate it. Have a platform do it, yeah. right? Uh, what does that translate to? You know, this whole time we've been talking about tailored access. You know, Nick's more important than I am. He needs access to everything. I shouldn't be trusted with hardly a screwdriver. You know, just give me access to the minimum things that I need to do my job, yeah. right? So granularity in those permissions. And, and, and the types of resource, the types of access, when they need it, Yeah. right? Uh, very important. Yeah, and in our world, we, we refer to that as role-based access mm -hmm. controls, mm -hmm. right? If you're part of the HR team, you only need access to the HR applications. If you're part of vendor one who supports you know, this one line and facility one, yep. that's all you get access to. And if you're a special case, you're the power user, you need access yep. to everything, but you can continue to have that. Yeah. Or request more or access. Or request it, yep. Right? From, you know, and this is done dy dynamically, mm -hmm. right? It doesn't, you don't set it, you can set it and forget it. Zero trust. Every time you need access, we verify it. Therefore, every time your access could be different depending on your needs and use. Right? Yeah, so it has to be flexible. Mm -hmm. Flexible from a management perspective. It can't take all day for you to dish it out. Yeah. Flexible from an, a user perspective. We can't jump through hoops just to get our job done. And then from a workplace perspective, how does this translate into an actual impact? Well, the impact is everybody has the tools to do what they need. When we talked about the impact on the workflows, Every transaction now can be audited. I don't have to shut down my line if I think it's been compromised or if I think there's a network failure. I know at any given time, if there is a breach, how the breach occurred, what the source of a breach. I know the facts of my breach, if they ever occur, and I've limited the blast radius because I am no, I'm not permitting resources to go to try to go sideways or east-west within my network. Yeah. So now I have a network safety, my, human safety, yep. right? Uh, and, and I understand from the 
point of view of risk management and compliance, even from insurance perspective, yeah. I can deliver all the goods now. I know exactly what has occurred on my network, what my time to remediation is, and when my impact is. And I think that's important. And that's all of the concepts that you just said, probably in those last two or three sentences, is, is what we strive for. Yeah. So not only in the world of operational technology, uh, for the past few years, we've been leading the standards. We're now seeing, I think, in your discussions with different you know, groups like NIST and ISA, mm -hmm. They're starting to implement zero trust and, and cloud, right? Yeah. So we'll see what ISA, for example, the concept of accessing cloud for analytics, cloud for IoT. Uh, so that's going to be the reality very, very soon. Yeah. Uh, the guidance on zero trust coming out of, of the White House, for example, yep. as best practices, you know, we need to heat that. And if, you know, if it's come to the point that the White House is mentioning it, so it means it's been, it's been there for a while. Government is so yeah. advanced, yeah. though. Yeah. They're always first when it comes exactly. to things. Uh, but it, and then it it boils down into it has to be user friendly, you know, not just because things are more pleasant, but because the individuals that we work with, we can't take anything for granted. Correct. Right. And we drives adoption. Yeah, yeah. And we can't assume that not only are they willing to jump through hoops, but they're able to jump through hoops. Yeah. So it, it has to be dead simple. Yeah. And finally, you know, the people have been hesitant in, in moving towards cybersecurity on the OT networks just for the sake of usability. It's always been a little bit of a compromise. Like if I start having to do lifecycle management and maintenance and understanding what software works with what patch level, then I'm kind of screwed. But the reality is you don't have to be. If you have a zero trust approach where every time someone needs a resource to uh, access, uh, then you verify that and then you only make that resource available, uh, you're no longer compromising your air gap yeah. for, for the purpose of usability. And so I think it's, it's inevitable that organizations are going to go down this road. And so... My recommendation to them, of course, I would love to speak with them ourselves and, and, yeah. and talk with them, but whether that's the case or not, look for platforms, look for tools that don't just meet the objective today, but look at what's coming, right? Mm -hmm. There's NIST 800, I think it's the, is it the 83 uh, standard that's yep. being updated right now, right? There's new things being included that's about to be rolled out. Make sure when you select something, when you go down a road, when you have it in the back of your mind, mm -hmm. Think of it from that perspective. Okay, I don't just want to be ready today. I want to spend my money and get yeah. get you know something that's worth it, something that's also going to be relevant a year from now, five years from now. Make sure it speaks your language as well. Yeah, and it has to work with your systems. Yes, exactly. Right, and that's why it's been such a mix mixed bag in this environment. Right, you can't just take IT tools and throw them in an OT environment. They don't work. No, correct. And you had a good slide on the principles like translating themselves into industrial control systems, and I think that's important. Uh, I think we're getting a little bit more of a blur between the demarcation between IT and OT, but for sure, I mean, the, the, the approaches uh, need to be cognizant of the types of systems that we have in the OT space, and they're quite different. Yeah. And so I kept this to the end purposely because every webinar that I've looked at the past little while, they all throw these big, scary stats up out front. And I wanted to get into the meat of things before we, we talk about kind of the, the larger impact. but. These are, are from, I, I believe it was an IBM report that was published on 2022 last year. 21% of the attacks they looked at were ransomware attacks. Mm -hmm. You know, 41% exploited phishing, 33 vulnerabilities. Those are your big three, right? Manufacturing, number one. Number one on this list. It's been too easy, right? Yeah. Let's, let's face it, I think target of opportunities is what people look for, whether they're nation state or private groups. Uh, if they find any difficulty in accessing or breaking into, they move on to the next thing. But manufacturing historically has been a huge target of opportunity because of the, you know, the lax uh, lifecycle management uh, in the tooling. Well, I think the next one actually speaks to that. So if we look at manufacturing and the attacks there, over half, mm -hmm. 61% on the industrial side. Yeah, it's, it's unsurprising. Uh, once you're in, once you're past the DMZ, once you're in the industrial control zone, it's very easy typically to navigate on, unless there are extremely tight network uh, policies there. Uh, so that, that's not surprising. Yeah. And the last one that I wanted to make sure we put up here. So you can see if you compare that first block top left mm. to the last one bottom right, it's disproportionate the amount of okay. ransomware attacks, specifically industrial control systems. Yeah, it's a pain point. Right? Yeah. If you're, if you're down, you're down. And it's, 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 it's crucial. It's brutal. So no, they exploit that. And, and that's the conversation that we have all the time in terms of, all right, 
everything has a cost to it. But when you're thinking about the cost and you're calculating the benefit, there's a benefit in terms of operational benefits. There's also a benefit in terms of if my line were to go down, if I get ransomware, if it laterally traverses across the VPN mm -hmm. from a vendor into my network and that entire facility goes down, what does it cost you to have a facility offline for, let's give them the benefit of the doubt, three weeks. Let's yeah. say they are, you know, best, best case. Usually you're talking months, but let's yeah. say it's three right. weeks. What does that cost? Yeah, there's costs of supplier reputation, you yeah. know, contracts, it's, safety. It's, it's, it's huge. It's incredible. Yeah. Um, with that, with a couple minutes left, and feel free to screenshot that. Uh, we've been talking for a while. You know, Nick, again, CTO. I lead the sector practice here. And what I'm going to do is I see a couple questions that have come into the chat. So if you just bear with me one moment, what I'm going to do is pull a few of these up. I appreciate it, Jake. So one, we'll go for Jake's one first, and then there was a couple privately sent as well. So uh, considering the complexity of modern manufacturing lines, how does least privilege access help ensure systems aren't just secure, but are operating, operating efficiently. So we've talked about this a few times, but if you had to sum it up in about two lines. Uh, per resource access uh, and continued productivity. That's really it. Uh, you don't have, you're not chasing your IT group for changes into your network policy on the individual devices in your systems. Yeah. Uh, you don't need to explain to IT the complexity of specific sensors and what port they operate on because you're still going to use your native tooling yeah um uh, and then you don't have to go in and and clean up after right yeah so you, you don't have to review who's got access now and what and you only find out your vpn access is down because you haven't used it in six months and you go back because you need it and it doesn't work and you have to start over yeah uh, you know there, there's a lot of efficiencies there. so you you cannot just give it give access but you can guarantee that they have access when they need it without exposing anything. Yeah. Fantastic. Uh, the other one there, I'm gonna get to one of the private ones maybe before I get to Jake's second one. Um, Nick, I think this is directed at you. So in your experience, you've seen the evolution yeah. of IT and cloud security. What about Agilicus and the Agilicus approach stands out when it comes to the convergence of IT and OT specifically in manufacturing. Yeah, you summed it up in a nice slide there. Uh, we have a lot of experience in broadband networks, routing networks. Our team has you know, traveled the world and, 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 and deployed equipment in those types of networks. So understanding cloud security uh, is something we're very, very good at. Yeah. Uh, understanding cloud security posture management, understanding the aspect of the you know, shared responsibility model, the lack of perimeters. Uh, from a security perspective, and then applying, then looking at OT and seeing what are the best features from a cybersecurity approach that we can apply there. Because we're seeing the OT network sort of changing. We're seeing it becoming more open, and we're saying, oh my God, now there's so many things behind it that haven't been kept up with uh, that you know we need to apply best practices there, and zero trust comes into mind. Identity access management, least privilege, the auditability, from the risk management and compliance and governance of these manufacturing plants. So, and the uh, odd Windows 2003 server yeah, somewhere. Yes, you know, you have Windows 2003 that's off by two and a half hours and yeah. it doesn't. So, we understand that approach, we understand the concept, and we understand how to apply it to OT very, very well. Okay. We have people like you in that sector that help us, you know, highlight you know, the, the, the glaring problems, and we've been very successful at doing that. So that's where we, I think we stand out. We have expertise in both fields uh, through many, many years, uh, and we're able to understand the translation from one to another. And, and, and I think that's an excellent answer. The last one that I want to get to here before we wrap things up officially, uh, we talked about granular access. We've talked about least privileged access. Mm -hmm. Why isn't that more work? If you told me, okay, go pick up every single grain of sand on the beach individually, it sounds like a lot of work. Why isn't that more work specifically for the IT teams? Right. So we combine, like I mentioned, a couple of approaches to make this very easy. Yeah. The first one is the lifecycle management of that account. I'm not going to provision new users. Where I'm going to use existing credentials. Yeah. First. From the point of view of the OT person, I'm not going to impose new tooling. I'm going to not going to impose new software suites, new VPN clients to deploy. 
So that's another simplification. Yeah. The other one is I'm not going to have my IT now keep up with my OT changes on my firewall. So from a security posture. Yeah. So I combine these three things. I'm removing a lot of toil and hardship on merging my IT team uh, in, a, in a change management process with my OT team desire to be operational at any time. Yeah. So that you know, is a lot of uh, pressure relief uh, to, you know, to, to in, in, a, in a network where zero trust and agilicus platforms are deployed. And when you say, you know, all the things that we do, you, we don't have a consulting practice. You mean all the things a platform does. Correct. And Correct. something that does all that kind of stuff and, and wraps into it, you know, wraps everything into one, what's it like to deploy? How long? On average. Uh, an organization can deploy themselves in 10, 15 minutes. Uh, I've seen eager customers be end-to-end -end deployed half hour yeah. tops. And that we're talking complex deployments here. Yeah. Uh, so having no on-site software suite deployment, all cloud-based, all provisioning is API and cloud-based. The only thing that goes on site that I mentioned was a small piece of connector, which is completely ubiquitous, runs everywhere, very easy to deploy. Uh, that's you know, 15 minutes, 30 minutes being uh, conservative even. And I think you know that's a great point because the thing that comes up with us time and time again, how long does it take to deploy? I've tried to go down this road before. It's and months. It's months, yeah. right? And so we're talking, not even an afternoon, mm -hmm. potentially shorter than this webinar. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And so with that, we'll leave it there. I want to thank everybody for joining uh, this week's Agilicus webinar, looking at making sure manufacturing lines are kept safe, efficient, and secure. Yeah. And if you're watching a replay, I hope you enjoy your August vacation. There you go. Take care. We'll talk to you again soon.